this is a place I want to discuss with you, Charles and Lisa, about what's been going on on the market, because is it a good time to buy? Is it a good time to sell? There's a lot of things going on here. I think that sellers need to price properly if they want to get rid of their properties um, and buyers are in a good place to negotiate. What do you guys think? Yeah, the, the number one question, you know, we'll start with buyers first, is that going into the spring, I was fully expecting to have a good spring because 2018, 2019, I specifically remember in 2018, it was Easter weekend. And then the, every weekend after that, those open houses were terrible. And I was just thinking, okay, I guess we're hitting the height of inventory. And all of that inventory started coming off the market in the late last year. So I was like, okay, this is good. Buyers are getting excited, COVID hits. So what explaining to a buyer that the pricing is already decreased from 2016, 2017 is tough because they want a discount on the listing price along with the discount that it's already listed at. So explaining it to a buyer through graphs and obviously this, along with telling an owner, listen, I can't get you the price and that you want. So I don't know, I'm a little hesitant to say that there's gonna be a splash of inventory. You know, I, I, you know, just give you one example. I met with someone last week, she has a three bedroom and she said, I met with an agent right before this. He told me I can get 2.5. I said, this is the best comparable. It's not an exactable, but it's a great comparable. We can't get you 2.5 because this comparable is at 2.2 and it's still on the market. There's a lot of owners that, if Frank speak is being told to them that they will wait until the spring after the election, hopefully COVID is a little bit better. You know, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, we'll, we'll see if owners choose to sell who's ever on the market needs to sell. You know, that's what I tell the buyers. So we're putting in some low offers <laughs> to be honest. It's tough even making that call to the listing agent. I'm curious what you guys have been seeing. Um, regarding these buildings and just new developments and condos in general. Yeah, I, you know, I, I saw this in 2009, the Atelier, the Sheffield, you know, these huge condominiums that they're all roughly the same layout. The views are roughly the same. They, you know, the E-line from 10 to 42, floor 42 are roughly the same. So what we saw in FIDI was obviously the transformation from office buildings going to what was supposed to be condos. They actually went to rentals. And I was down there on Wall Street at a, a smaller firm at the time, and they were condo finishes, but a rental. And I just remember seeing the trend of that happening and then seeing these huge buildings that I just I just remember at that time to persuade buyers to just think into the future. I, I would never persuade them not to buy, but I would always just say in these 400, 500 unit buildings, you know, we're going to see it down uh, at the seaport. There's there's a huge one that's going up. I think 900 units. There's going to be a lot of competition at another time, even to rent out. You know, these these places still have 30, 40 units for rent. So that's an even tougher position for an owner to be in. That's super interesting. Are you seeing like, how are you seeing demand during COVID for these condos versus co-ops? Yeah, so going to actually back to the new development is I have strictly new development buyers that have actually pulled back. And the reason they pulled back is rentals, which I know we'll get to, but because the landlords are pretty seasoned on how large the vacancy is, they're offering these buyers crazy incentives to keep them in the apartment. So the buyers are coming to me, they're like, I know this new development is you know, there's closing costs or something else being offered. My landlord's telling me he's giving me two, three, free, two or three free months. There's no pressure for them to leave their rental because their lease is coming due. So landlords are obviously getting the door knocked by banks that are asking for their funds. So it'll be interesting if they go to rentals, uh, what incentives they'll offer because there'll be a lot of incentives. Yeah, and Charles, we're getting another question here. You know, you mentioned off-market negotiating sales. What exactly do you mean by that? So uh, we like off-market because it kind of brings a seller in this market where they don't have people going throughout their home. They are probably working from home, so they would have to leave the apartment. It's not like they're already at their office space when I'm showing it at midday. So they have to pack up everything. They always have to keep it clean. So what we're seeing is kind of a pushback that says, if I can't get my pricing, I kind of want to wait a little bit. So what we do is we go in there and we just take the trusty old phone out. The, the new one's great because it gets the wide angle and just say, hey, listen, we'll keep this as an off-market opportunity. We'll take a video. I have my colleague film it and I just explain it. And then when we run across a buyer, we send the video that's not listed on YouTube to the buyer and then they get uh, a great, uh, 
not only a preview, but they can make the decision because it's, it's a full property tour. It's six, seven minutes. So they know exactly everything, the view, the closets. It's, it's not like two minutes of highlights. It's everything. So owners have actually preferred that. I had a conversation with someone who we're going to be doing that uh, with them. So that's an yeah. off-market if we find a buyer. Yeah. Well, especially with the international buyers, you know, you're just seeing that has almost completely dried up because obviously there's a quarantine, 14 days, and I'm in the capital of Times Square. So I see that I did actually ironically story about this on Instagram yesterday where it's good to see tourists. You know, they're tourists, they're walking slow, they're looking around. So that's good to see. That's necessary because that's helping out restaurants, service industry, hotels, you know, which, you know, all of that is necessary. Like the tourism industry is massive. So if we're not even seeing tourists, you're not going to see buyers, you know, international buyers. And those are the new development. Those are the nicer condos that are about five, six years old. Yeah. The, I'll just throw it out there. The, the rental market is in the gutter. I don't see any foreseeable future that's coming back this year. Like it's brutal. It is. I'll just, one conversation I had with this, this guy, we manage about 10 of his properties. We manage total probably 25 properties on behalf of uh, investors. The conversation I had, I said, I have literally had, and you know, obviously costs uh, to throw up a rental has been just, you know, enormous because you're, you're, you have longer days on the market. You're showing it more often. So it's taking time away from what would normally be a one to two day process, one week max at all of our places. So landlords for nine years, pretty much 2011 to about even up to maybe last year, end of last year has been fine. But this year we, it was literally clawing for him to say yes, just, and we're going short term because that's the only option that we have. And it's, it's actually 10% below the tenant that just moved out, that just moved out. So I, I did a search, 151 bedrooms in this price range. I'm like, this is crazy. No, I'm getting more people that are looking to sublet their place because they have no need to be in their apartment or in New York City, and, and they want a larger space. So yeah, this year is going to be a lot of hurt for landlords, a lot of hurt. And I'll, I'll just throw this out. In 2009, downtown in the financial district, they were offering upwards of three three months and paying the broker, I highly uh, speculate that those incentives will come back. You know, 15 month lease, three free months, will pay the broker, even one building, 200 Water Street downtown was offering a two month commission to the brokers just to rent out their place. So those incentives will come back in a hurry. Are there fewer, like who are, who's renting or buying right now? What is like, what? Yeah, I'm just curious. <laughs> so ironically enough, the last two that we rented on behalf of owners that were 10%, actually more than 10%, and uh, we offered them a free month. So it's 10% lower rent. Uh, they were both students. So one was going to Columbia Law. The other one was going to NYU Dental. And I think they're going to be remote. But I, you know, I, I thank God for them because I'm in an office space that's 16 stories. There's probably no joke, 10 people in the entire building right now. I'm looking out, I'm in Midtown, all the high rises on 6th Avenue, all of them that are office space, they're all empty. No one, no one needs to go to an office. So they're saying, if I don't need to go to an office and I'm sick and tired of my studio, one bedroom, why don't I just do this from Jersey Shore? Uh, Hudson Valley is skyrocketing, the uh, New Jersey. So this kind of just crunched the people that wanted more space. They're now demanding that space or at least a backyard or, you know, like you said, the employment, you know, the service industry, Broadway, they're just, they're crushed, you know, and any of that, they're not renewing their leases. Charles, you mentioned the Jersey Shore and the Hudson Valley. Uh, we're getting a question here. Are there any neighborhoods that you are um, seeing the rental market prices remaining high and tight and where you are seeing prices the lowest and the loosest? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the highest and tight would probably be, uh, I would say the Upper West Side, we got the most traction. Downtown, lowest and loosest. You, you, that was where we had 151 bedrooms in like a $500 radius. So I, I went, I, I wouldn't want to be a landlord down there. Ton of my friends that are just asking me questions. Can I negotiate? Should I resign my lease? And they're telling me the exact same story is I need to exercise. I want to be outdoors and I can't really do that in New York City. So they are 
they're just not coming back. So they're staying in out west. You know, I know uh, people on this call are out west. You know, I wish I was there. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, you know, the trend that I'm seeing is people that had office jobs that are still employed are not coming back. And those, a lot of them, you know, I just got someone yesterday. I, I, I need to, I, I just want to break my lease. I don't even want to be here. So it's like an unhappiness thing. So there's going to be a trend of a lot of the people that are employed at an office job that they're just not required to be at the office. So they're just not even coming back. I don't know if they'll ever come back. I don't know. They might like Colorado and California too much. I remember an agent when phase two started and we were allowed to actually legally work. So an agent posted on social media that this is good for all the places that have amenities. And I'm thinking they can't even use these amenities. <laughs> you know, so it's like I have this gym I can't use, this lounge I can't use, this children's playroom I can't use, yet I'm paying for it. So, I, you know, the, the one place that we just rented, I said, well, there is that. I can't show it to you and you can't use it, but it's in the building. You know, the roof was open. So I showed them that beautiful views. They could work from home. But as you said, the rental market bakes that into it as opposed to a non-amenity building. So the people are opting for doorman. And if that, you know, they just want to go for price right now. Yeah, I really feel the 18 month lease will come back. You know, 15 months, you pay rent, three months are free, 18 months. They just, they need to put people in apartments and they'll offer anything and there's way too much competition right now i I, that was the exact conversation and and the landlord is used to me getting him record prices and i'm like all we have right now is a short term that's (laughs) a 12 percent below what we just rented it to someone who just left and you're paying me and you're giving them a free month it's going to be survival the fittest and a lot you know i'll also just throw it out there for tenants you know my sister is moving ironically enough back to new york city i was like you need to rent this year lock in a two year lease because at one time that $3000 apartment is now going to be 3500 you know when maybe in 10 months a year or whatever but i'm like sign a two year lease at 3000 and in the long term you'll save you know a lot of money but other call that I had with someone that we just put in the the con- lease application today, she said, she's European and she said, do they pay the HOA fees? I'm like, uh, no, they don't pay the HOA fees. They just pay the rent. So in Europe, apparently they pay the rent and the HOA, fee, HOA, HOA fees, you know, common charges, maintenance, whatever you want to call it. But the problem was that she's looking at a mortgage and a maintenance or mortgage common charges taxes of like $3,700. And we're going, she's losing $700, $800 out of pocket because what's the alternative? We put it on at a huge loss or do you just eat $700 for a year? So the actual math on that is a priority. Like this is what we can sell it for. Here's the loss. And then here's the monthly loss. One is, they're both cash. But, you know, do you want to lose $100,000 or $700 a month for a year, year and a half? So they're obviously opting for the $700, which is, it's a very uncomfortable conversation. Nobody wants to have it, but it's necessary to help out the owner, the future of New York City. So it's, you know, the conversations that we're having are so similar to 2009. It's hesitancy. Everyone's telling them not to do something, buy or sell or rent. There's different opinions. There's, nobody has you know, the, the train is not all moving the same direction. So the tracks are all over the place. And then we're kind of here to say, that's incorrect. This is correct. Let's f- focus on the facts. And, you know, I'll just go to something that just came top of mind is that Mark Zuckerberg was being interviewed by CNBC. And he said, you know, we're looking to do virtual, all virtual by 2030, because we can tap talent in the middle of the country that doesn't want to go to San Francisco, Austin, New York City. So that's an interesting trend that I'm actually seeing among renters who would normally become buyers. There are really three types of the market, like the co-op condo market, that is the everyday person that, you know, the one bedrooms are roughly between six to a million, you know, 800,000. Then you have the mid tier, mid luxury, and then you have the higher end, the higher end. It's going to, you know, I, I can't see that coming back for many, many, many years because there's so much inventory on the market. The mid tier is interesting because we're seeing prices go down, but there's just not enough on the market. And then kind of the lower tier 
going down, there's actually one subset that I'm getting into. I've had four bidding wars on one bedrooms in the Clinton Hill kind of area, and they've all went over the asking price. So <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, but anytime an $800,000 one bedroom comes on the market in that area, they go. It's crazy. So there's not enough inventory there. Um, if it's priced well, it's going to go. But if I was an owner, I would just wait it out. It's going to rebound. It always does. It's just this, the, the financial sector moved into service sector after the Great Recession. And we'll see where we go from here. I think we'll go to more into tech. You know, you're seeing that obviously Moynihan Station, Facebook, Amazon. So we'll see. I think we'll move into tech for jobs. And, and I'll actually just throw this out. I know I've been ranting, but <laughs> the the conversation about uh, buyers is that they're actually going to the places that they've always wanted to go during the summer, which would be a lake house or a beach house or something like that. So this kind of just condensed that. And now they're enjoying it. Those are the people that need to return once the office spaces start opening up, that's the return we'll start seeing to the rental and to the sales market when those offices that are all vacant right now start opening up and people can return. We, I might not be having this conversation if it's a five-year thing. <laughs> I'll be uh, you know, doing, I don't know, waiting tables. But election year does play into it. In 2012, 2016, and 2008, there's just a lot of hesitancy around election years, even if this was a decent time. So 2012, it was a pretty good time. 2016 was definitely a good time, but it was still very slow. All the homes that we took off in the fall of 2015 for the election, we put on in 2016, and we sold them at the price that we wanted because there was hesitancy. Right now, we have so much going on. So I would say it's not the pricing is not going to be better. But I think that sellers are recognizing they can't get the price they want. So they're just going to hold off. So there's not going to be as much inventory, which is going to help it out. Because um, I'm having those conversations. I just had one today. The guy said, uh, I just can't get the price. So I'm not going to put it on the market. So I said, all right, we'll do the off-market transaction or we'll try and find it. So I would say the rental market is at least 18 months out, You know, probably 12 months minimum. The sales market is also probably 12 to 15 months. Probably next fall, we'll see you know, that, that upward. You don't know until it's behind you, but the spring is going to be a little bit better, but it's not going to be like, oh my God, it will probably be next fall. Well, we'll start seeing, okay, we're breathing. COVID's done, elections behind us, you know, things like that. So I'm, I'm a numbers guy, but I seen the, the, the peaks and the valleys is great to show consumers because the number one metric I was paying real close attention to, because it was so vital to not a lot of buyers, you know, looking for homes was how many new homes were coming on the market. And we were just seeing skyrocketing double digits in Queens for multiple months. And you could kind of see that when you're taking the Long Island Railroad, you just see how much Queens has transformed because you had these massive high rises that all came on roughly at the same time. So this is a great tool, especially 50,000 above that. That's crazy. And that's 2017 levels. I had that today. I, you know, I storied about it because just getting a deal done, because the first, the first thing that I explained to him was that I can't even do my job because not enough people are actually contacting me. So it's not like it's a lack of salesmanship. You know, I'm great at sales, so it's not like it's me. You know, yeah, maybe obviously take full responsibility, but I'm telling them every single week, every single Tuesday, I reach out and I say, you know, here it is in the market. We have 150. That's a real number, 150 one bedrooms we're competing with in this $500 price range. I'm doing absolutely nothing different than what I did renting out your other units. The market is just not good. It's 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 an empathetic conversation because I lead with his objections, which is I'm not doing a good enough job. It's not being marketed anywhere. I'm not showing it enough. So you're 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 kind of handling the objections, and then you also bring up solutions. So he was never open ever at any time to a short term rent or reducing the rent. So it was like let's let's put this person in here and we'll revisit this in January. I have no idea what it's going to be like in January. I hope it's not worse than what it is now, but I'm, a, you know, I'm an optimistic guy. So it's, it's really saying, put someone in here to handle your costs. It's different with an individual owner, which was our other um, person on the Upper West Side, because this is our only unit. She's paying $3,700 in 
uh, in building costs plus her mortgage, and we just rented it at three thousand. Okay, she doesn't want she doesn't want to write that check. Okay, seven hundred dollars per month. It's also the empathetic that was on for two months. It's it's it, it was way too many times it was shown. So it's really a weekly update with the reality, and I just I, I rip off the band aid every single time. You know, I just say this is the reality, and we need to do this to rent out your unit. And then the last thing I'll say, because again, I could go on a rant, is that you have to say the alternative is if we pass on this person, whether it's a crazy incentive or a low price, it could be another month, which means that that's three thousand dollars we're losing. You have to pay thirty-seven hundred dollars, so you have to put it into the future as well. Landlords that were not really open to the organizations that would secure a guarantor position are now open to that, and those were individual owners that wanted a person instead of a company because what they do is they actually just give over a bond i'm going to sue a company if they don't pay rent because we just had that we actually had somebody that was during covid was not moving out they weren't paying rent for three months i'm getting the call every single day and they said the guarantor uh also lost their job you know so they were then open to a larger company and i'm talking about the guarantors or uh you know something rent i forgot the other ones but the companies that guarantor on behalf because you can't take more than one month security or extra months up front. So that opened the door for these big companies. So that that kind of helps us out. And to those people that are international students, they don't have a, a green card or a visa, they're on a student visa, or people that may not have good credit. So it, it helps out in the long run, the, pretty much any tenant. A lot of these buyers and sellers are so tuned in right now because they have social media, their neighbors are now on building link. So they're saying, hey, listen, does anyone wanna buy my apartment? Does anyone wanna you know, look at my studio, downgrade, upgrade, pieters? They also obviously have regular news. So they're so tuned in that, the, unfortunately, that the news is a little bit behind on the actual market sometimes because they're getting a month or two months old data and they're saying it's like right now. So I would say, it probably will be absorbed in the next 15 months. And then it'll take about 18 months where you start to see maybe a, you know, like a straight line <laughs> or like, like that, you know, that's all we're looking for. That little bit of optimism.